Hey everyone, this is Paul, and welcome to my third official review video. Today I'm going to be covering a topic that most of you probably wouldn't think that I would cover, and that's I am going to do a review on the video game Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, henceforth abbreviated as 999 to avoid such a mouthful of a title. And some of you that have seen a lot of my videos or know my value systems might say, well, Paul, that game is rated M for, like, pretty much everything. And that's true. There is a lot of mature content in that game. I would definitely not advise the faint of heart to play it. But on the other hand, it's, as my dad says, if you know your faith well and you take it for entertainment value and for the morals that you can get out of it, then one can find a surprisingly good time. So, it, I'll, of course, do a part two, like I always do with my reviews, talking about my Catholic perspective on the game later, but for now I'm just going to review the game by itself. And this game is utterly phenomenal. You do not want to miss on this relatively little-known game, because graphic novels are surprisingly rare in the U.S. I mean, how many Phoenix Wright games have there been, for instance? Simply not enough. But this game even puts that game to shame. I mean, if I had to do a mathematical ratio, I'd say there's about 90% of the game is just reading, and more reading, and more reading, because there's no cinematics, so even if there's anything besides reading, they're just still illustrations. And the game goes over the top in describing absolutely everything, from the characters' facial expressions, to the settings of the environment, to even describing what someone looks like after they've been killed. I mean, this game doesn't pull any punches in um, lacking description. I mean, this is about as close as you'll get to a virtual book as you can without actually reading a book. And you may be thinking, well, Paul, why don't I just read a book? Well, for one, the, the other 10% of the game is making decisions Usually what you say in a conversation will affect the way that the game plays out, so as a result it has tremendous replay value, and there's actually six possible endings you can get. The second thing is that there's puzzle rooms interspersed here and there, and while I wasn't as big of a fan of those as I was the, um, the reading part, I don't know, I guess I don't read much, so when I find a story that I actually enjoy, I really, really soak it in. But the puzzles, they get the job done. They're fairly simple, if you're good at math especially. And the characters often break up the monotony by talking about these really complex subjects that you might think, okay, that's cool, but what do they have to do with the storyline? Well, they eventually have everything to do with the storyline. But they just present it in a way so that you think it's unimportant, but then it's really important later. Kind of like... I mean, J.K. Rowling's a master at this in her Harry Potter books, how she'll just mention something casually in the first book, and then it'll be of huge importance in the seventh. That's basically how this game is. Like, for instance, when they're talking about face blindness. Trust me, it makes all the difference. So, yeah, the game, like I said, is rated M for a lot of things. But if you think about it, most of the stuff in there is what's called justifiable M-ratedness. A friend of mine knows how to explain it better than I do, but to make it simple, the main premise of the storyline is that you've got nine people that are trapped on a ship, and they're told that they have nine hours to escape the ship before it sinks. And there's these nine doors, and one of the doors has a number nine on it. Their objective is to get through the number nine door, because apparently that's the only way they can get out of the ship. And the thing is, most of them don't trust one another, and most of them don't even know each other. So, for all they know, one of the nine could be the one that's trapping them in the ship, or all of them could be, or maybe they can all trust each other. But they don't know that, and neither does the player. So you're constantly in the sense of, who do I trust, who do I think is going to backstab me. And so as a result, you know, there's a lot of language, there's a lot of yelling, there's violence, and if you think it might be over the top, because trust me, there's a lot of F-bombs in there, you have to realize there's a lot at stake in this game. I mean, I won't explain everything, but let's just say that there are rules that the characters have to follow, 
And if they don't follow the rules, then they're going to be killed. And not just killed, but brutally killed. And especially when they think that everyone's against each other, the tension levels are real, and the writing is emphasizing the realism of the characters. How, like, you would probably react just like they were if you were trapped in a sinking ship, and the guy over the loudspeaker had the gall to call it the nonary game. Like, this is a game? Really? <laughs> so thankfully, the rules of the game aren't really something that you have to keep track of too much, because the game's characters do a great job of reminding you of what the rules are. And I think that's one of the game's strong points, is you never really forget what's important. Like, the characters go through a lot of the important details of the story over and over again, and because there's six endings, of course you're going to be replaying the story a lot. Yes, you can skip dialogue you've already read, but unfortunately the game doesn't let you skip the puzzles, which kind of Oh my goodness, does that get irksome, especially when you choose an ending you've already gotten, and you're like, ah, oh, I just went through all those puzzles for nothing. Thankfully, the game's sequel fixes that problem, but I'll save that for another review. And of course, once you finally do get the true ending, <whistles> prepare yourself for, <clears throat> yes, it's probably way more text than should be allowed in a video game, but it features one of the most mind-blowing endings I have ever experienced in any form of media. And it's, it's a type of ending that wouldn't be possible to have in just a regular book. And that's all I'm going to say there, because if I say any more, then that'll totally sap the joy of the game. Because, the, in my opinion, the biggest enjoyment you'll get out of the game is by just experiencing the story and following along with the twists and turns, and it's as some people say, it's all about the journey, and sometimes that's better than the destination. And in this game, both the journey and the destination are equally rewarding. But if you go to just the destination first, you'll lose all of the build-up, all of the how did we get to this ending, and it's just... Whew. Literally, my mind was like fried in the best way possible after playing that game, so I certainly hope you all can experience that for yourself as well. So, my recommendation is if if you can put up with the a lot of the M-rated stuff, this is definitely one of the most underrated and beloved gems in the DS library. In fact, it's my second favorite DS game apart from The World Ends With You, which I plan on tackling in a separate review. And actually one of the greatest games I've ever played for that matter. So, Check it out. Um, definitely write down the solutions to the puzzles after you solve them, because you'll be solving them a lot. But if you can put up with the game's repetitious structure, there's really not much else to complain about. So knock yourselves out and get ready for the graphic novel experience of a lifetime. And stay tuned for part two, which is what a Catholic can get out of this game. So until then, stay epic, keep the faith, and God bless. Bye.